And reviewing the papers for us this morning, we're delighted to have Kate Hardcastle, the retail expert, consumer psychologist from Insight with Passion. Hello, Kate. Good morning, Vanessa. How I do, are you? I'm all right, thanks. I didn't tell you I was going to ask you this, but I wonder if you could help us a bit iron out the, the Morrisons story. Is this a hostile bid for Morrisons, a hostile takeover? And what's going on? Yeah, I think it's very, very interesting. I think one of the things about Morrison's that might be appealing to an investor is its very close relationship with Amazon. And it's exploring opportunities to bring what they call Amazon pantry to life, the idea that Amazon would be a grocery supplier. I think that's created the interest more than anything. And I think we're going to see a very turbulent and changing time with our big grocery stores over the next few years as they work out what they're going to look like. We saw that big takeover of Asda. Uh, by the uh, company that is heavily involved with a lot of petrol stations. So I'm imagining there'll be a lot of supermarkets in, intermingled with the service station, petrol station uh, opportunity. It's interesting times, Vanessa. Uh, and, and will they be able to resist it? Is, is the hallmark of a hostile takeover that you can't, res- you're not empowered to resist it, you have to sell? No, I, I think there there is going to be a resistance, but I think the share price is reflected quite quite uh, adequately for everyone to feel quite happy about that. And it might be interesting as what comes next. Right. OK, well, we'll watch that space. Your first Definitely. choice of story today, the Daily Mail. Ministers poised to end ambulance curbs from July the 19th. That will be a great relief to some people. Others will feel much more cautious and, and maybe worried about it. Completely. I think more than anything, the fact that the speculation goes on pretty much daily on nearly all of the front covers and has done for quite a few months, whilst I absolutely understand people's desperate need to travel, I think the confusion is just absolutely paramount. I don't think anyone really understands without going into great detail what might be on the horizon, when it might be on the horizon and what that means to us all. And obviously, every time we're talking about travel, there's this big association with holidays. We know that the travel industry has been hugely hit. We've also got to think about the tourism element of it, of how dependent we are in the UK, particularly London, on that tourism element that's not incoming at the moment. And I think in addition to that, there are people wanting to travel for so many other reasons, be that to see family, for business, etc. So we do want to see change, but we want to see change happen that doesn't put us out of kilter of our, our work and progress today. And I understand that's why some people would be cautious and say, well, I'm quite happy here. Very interesting story in the Financial Times that you found today. And this is, despite the pandemic, which has rendered some people so impoverished, particularly the excluded, who, you know, haven't been uh, in receipt of any sort of financial help or aid, and they really are in terrible stuff. And we hear of people having to sell their homes and people, you know, who really just don't know how to carry on without the help of food banks and things like that. Mm. But what you found in the Financial Times, tell everybody what, what this story is, Kate. That more than 5 million people have become millionaires despite being in pandemic. And I think the clear line on this is that the rich and the poor gap has widened. So to put context to this, yes. uh, th- there are most adults that have less than $10,000 in uh, assets. And I think that's the realistic. About 55% of us are not in this zone where we can look to the last year and say, well, we're better off because of it. Mm. But the rich have become richer in the main. And that's down to the fact that Uh, There's been cheap money available. It's been uh, an opportunity to inflate your asset prices. And therefore, those of us who, certainly not me, but have been able to uh, use this as an opportunity to leverage have done exactly that. So I I, I mean, I'm I'm just sitting here allowing these terms to float entirely over my head. The one, (laughs) because I don't understand what they mean and I must stop you and ask you. So did you say you could use it, I think you said, as an opportunity to inflate your assets, which to me sounded like a boob job. I don't know what you mean by, what do you mean by inflate your assets? What does that mean? Even. You're quite right to stop me. I was getting a bit too technical. There, yeah, what I does think that mean? If you, if you have money to speculate, you can accumulate. And I think this is the time where people have done that successfully. So if they already were on a base of having property assets, they've been able to either use a bit of cheap borrowing money to be able to go and get more assets, take mm. a risk, or take advantage of things that were at sale for a cheaper price. So people who have been in a comfortable position many have been able to take the next step and being able to come even more comfortable in life. Although you might think that, for example, property speculation would have been to some extent nipped in the bud by the idea of people working from home and therefore, um, you know, corporate properties, commercial properties not being as desirable as once they were, companies desperate to offload them rather than acquire them, companies making a living leasing and renting commercial properties really in Stuch as as more and more um, companies announce where they don't want to 
head office anymore. They don't need it. And throwing the keys back in the pot. So I would have thought that it might have been more difficult to speculate and accumulate in the property market during the pandemic than it's been before. I think definitely the split between residential and commercial property is going to be quite, quite evident over the next few years as we start to understand the real effects of how that's that's looking for our places of work that are no longer frequented, the demand that might not be there for those retail properties. Exactly. But yeah, these these are people within the economy that have used that household wealth to make sure that they have been able to take opportunities out of, be it a cheaper product to buy, a cheaper investment opportunity, they have leveraged it. And I think that the gap, the widening is so concerning because we know, as you've just said, this has been also a time where people who have managed so far, who've managed to get by, have grafted and, and, and been hard workers for no fault of their own have found themselves in absolutely terrible awful situations but the whole the whole through no fault of their own story is is a very often a life story but b enormously underlined in a pandemic where none of it's any fault of your own is it if you happen to be sitting next to someone who had the virus you might have caught the virus you could have died of the virus if you weren't because you happened to be at the other side of the room at a wedding you didn't catch it you didn't die i mean a lot of this is through no fault of anyone's own isn't it really I, and, and industries that have suffered completely that were on a trajectory to success exactly. and just had that, that, that industry stop overnight. Exactly. And then the on-off as well, Vanessa. Mm-hmm. I think we think about industry closing down and reopening. The costs of actually reopening a business are so significant. So high, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So people who happen to be through no fault of their own in a business that would be profitable in a pandemic, like, for example, Zoom or like, for example, you know, the food and all the sorts of things that people could get delivered. And those who were through no fault of their own, as you just said, happened to be in a tourist related business where there was no trade and it was all packed in i mean it's 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 been that's been one of the 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 frightening delineating features of all of this hasn't it through no fault of your own and that makes people feel wildly out of control because it's as if however hard you try you can't influence it and that's the case it's horrible isn't it's horrible for everyone and thank you so much for that one now let's go on with this uh it's a story in the sun today it's a granddad what's happened to him Well, this, we talk quite regularly about high street and high streets of the future and what it might look like. But I think this is so evident to some of the challenges people face at the thought of hitting their local high street. This is a gentleman that has been hit with a £272 parking fine that started off as a 50 pence parking debt. He did pay for his parking. He just hadn't realised that the fees in his usual car park had gone up by 50 pence. Therefore, there was a shortfall. And now because he has tried to work and and write letters to that company that has not been accepted in that, he's ended up with in court with a county court judgment. Somebody that's not had credit issues all of his working life. This is a private car, p- car park, and uh, he's obviously explained that he's actually going to have to keep up. He's suffered from COVID himself, he mm. and his wife. His wife has leukemia. They haven't been able to uh, lead the normal life of late. They've had other things going on in their life other than arguing over a 50p parking fine. Mm-hmm. He's written to this company for goodwill. They've not lent it to him and I just think you know he's now got debt at a time of his life that he just doesn't want that and a CCJ he's saying how this will challenge him in terms of borrowing potential because he may have to continue his business but isn't this also just indicative of how many of us have been in a high street mm. we've faced this parking ticket and thought that's it I'm just not going to go back there again because this has been so unreasonable yes and also when you get the parking ticket and you thought that you'd carefully parked in the right place and then <laughs> subsequently you find it was the something yes. bay or something and next yes. to you was the kosher spot but the one you parked in very carefully thinking it was the right one wasn't the right one. I mean, that one where you're just like, oh, come on. I mean, I really exactly. tried. I looked, I read the sign. I got out the car, I put on my reading glasses. I peered <laughs> up at this wretched lamppost in the rain to see whether it was the right one or the wrong one. It, I thought it was the right one. I was absolutely legit. I wasn't trying to get away with anything. I wasn't, I wasn't hoping the parking fairy was going to save me from this. I was really doing my diligent best for this to work out. And somehow or other, I picked the wrong one. And then you've got the fine and you think, mate, don't you really? I'm just not. No. You nailed it, Vanessa. Yeah. You nailed that it. That one exactly really sucks. It. I mean, if you did it on purpose because you thought, oh, I might get away with it, then you think, oh, well, fair cop, gov. But if you didn't, then you really think, oh, God, this is so, so mean. Of course... There are many people listening to this who will say that those in, in control would rather we didn't go in the car anyway. They'd rather we got on Shanks's pony and walked there or on the bike, well, of course. 
it, it, you know, I would like to walk to my towns and city centres. I would like safe pathways to be able to do that. I'd like pathways I could, when it was the right time a couple of years ago, take a, a push chair on and feel mm. that it was safe and it wasn't bumpy and I wasn't feeling like I was weaving into a main road at every juncture. I mean, th these, these are the combinations of things that people need to do. If mm. there's a reason people keep using transport, there's a good reason for it. So what, what can you do to open up and enable those towns and cities to flourish once more? And it's really interesting that in the pandemic, we've seen this movement towards smaller villages and towns, obviously propelled by a lot of people working from home, mm -hmm. obviously people not going into cities, so they're using the local spaces. But I know that a lot of those villages and towns will have those hour free parking, that kind of reasonable bear, probably an easy accessibility, and people being able to just walk in and use public transport there too, in a way that the city centre one way loop congestion just isn't appealing. So absolutely let's make these places easy to access without the cars and finally the summer of shorts i was reading some article about this this morning at about 4 30 thinking, <laughs> thinking yeah right yeah right and the article was say i think it was the times or the telegraph or somewhere or other where they were saying you know yes but these shorts aren't short shorts they're long shorts and therefore they're perfectly acceptable for office wear and for women and gentlemen too i suppose of all shapes and sizes are you wearing them kate hardcastle say so on the bbc I am not. I was hoping that we might take contrasting views on this. It's a no from me. <laughs> Lovely call. Thank you so much, Kate Hardcastle, their retail expert and consumer psychologist from Insight with Passion, uh, reviewing the papers for us this morning.